Thank you, Brother Dan. I want to uh, first commend you as a church. You all do a great job of caring for one another and providing mutual support to one another. And uh, it's come to my mind this past week or so that I'm only one channel. And uh, whereas I would love to be in every place and uh, visiting everyone and encouraging everyone, um, I can't. But you receive a great blessing, as Sharon has pointed out, in giving of yourself and your time to one another and taking care of one another. And so I want to commend you on that because this church really does well in that area. And so give yourselves and God a praise. Um, this morning we want to talk a little bit about the resurrection. Um, not specifically as a topic, but the resurrection drives our mission. It drives what we do. The resurrection drives our method. Because our method uh, it has to be following our representative Christ, or we're probably not going to be as effective. And, of course, our message. Our message is Jesus is risen, isn't it? And Jesus is coming back. Can you say amen? You have to be smarter than the technology you're using. Another survey. I've produced a survey. Maybe Jonathan can show you right quick where that is on, online. I don't have any paper copies today. I do have a handout, so if I could have a couple of people to uh, help me distribute those. I have a handout for our lesson today. Thank you, brother. Brother Dan. Great. Excellent. So, but uh, every organization needs to kind of check on itself every now and then, and you can help us out greatly if you'd go and find that uh, survey. And uh, I know you're survey tired, Everywhere you go today, they ask you for a survey, but it's because as an organization, we're always starving for information. How effective are we? Are we reaching who we're trying to reach? Is our message as clear as we think it is? And this is because we're awful proud of ourselves, right? And so we, we oftentimes think we're a little better than we are. What I would just encourage you is to uh, put real facts in there, right? A lot of times, when we, especially if we have a beef, right? We use a lot of words that end in L-Y to try and reinforce our point, right? And uh, those words really do not uh, project a lot of useful information. Um, they're generally well based on opinion. So, but please, if you see something that's going well that you want to comment on and appreciate somebody for, or if you see an area in which we can improve, that's what we're all about. Amen? So as you're turning in your Bibles now to Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 9, we're going to go through this very well together this morning. Luke chapter 9, and beginning in verse 1, I'm just going to read 1 through 6, and then 10 and 11, and then we'll contemplate on it just a little bit. I'm reading from the New American Standard Version. And you can follow me along in your Bible or your Bible app there. The Bible says, And he, Jesus, called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all the demons and to heal diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to perform healing. And he said to them, Take nothing for your journey, neither a staff nor a bag nor bread nor money, and do not even have two tunics apiece. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that city. And as for those who do not receive you, as you go out from that city, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. And verse 10, when the apostles returned, they gave an account to him of all that they had done. Taking them with him, he withdrew by himself to a city called Bethsaida, interestingly enough, almost probably half a dozen of the apostles were from that city. Peter and Andrew, James and John, probably Philip and Nathaniel, all from Bethsaida. So this was a familiar place that they're retreating to. 
In verse 11, but the crowds were aware of this and followed him, and welcoming them, he began speaking to them about the kingdom of God and curing those who had need of healing. There's some very interesting and powerful information in the first three verses of chapter 9. First of all, uh, I want to invite you to come back where Jesus is there with his disciples 2,000 years ago. Can you do that with me this morning? Let's just imagine ourselves in this little village with Jesus right here, and we're with the twelve. Isn't that a special place to be? Amen. So that's the word that's used here. It's not just to call, like I would call Elizabeth. Hey, Elizabeth, right? But it's a, it's a compound word. It means come here, Elizabeth, or come here, the twelve. And so he's calling them together around him. Notice that Jesus is in the middle. And uh, we're seated right around him this morning as we begin to hear his words. He gave them power and authority over all demons and to heal all diseases. What is the meaning of Jesus calling is your first question there. The meaning is Jesus called together his disciples to assemble together to himself. That's the whole purpose of why we're here this morning. Jesus has called us, and we're all here together. Can you say amen? All right, you got to stay with me this morning. What is the significance of the twelve? You know, sometimes we raise this to a higher level than it really needs to be. The twelve is simply a representative of the church. It's a symbolic number. Let's go back to several thousand years more and imagine now that we're out in the desert of Sinai and we've just escaped Egypt through the Red Sea. Hallelujah. And we're formed into 12 tribes in our camp, and right in the center of the camp, what's there? Not yet. They hadn't built it. <laughs> it was a trick question. I'm sorry. But yes, eventually they would organize their camp so that the sanctuary was right in the center. But how many tribes were there? Another trick question. There were 13. Uh-huh. One of them was priests and served the other 12. All right? But the point is, none of those sons of Jacob were there, right? Judah and Reuben and Simeon and son. They weren't there, right? They have been dead more than 400 years. So it's a symbolic number, 12. It represents God's people. And the good news of that is, and you're, and you're number two there, this includes me. This includes me. It includes you. It's all God's people. So 12 is just a representative number, and we'll get to the apostles in just a moment. Number three. What two things did Jesus give? Verse 1 and 2. Power and authority. I heard it. Somebody said it. Power and authority. Jesus qualified and authorized. This is from Jameson Fawcett's commentary. Jesus qualified, gave them power, and authorized, he gave them authority. Go in my name. And do you see the multiplication that's going on here? Just like the pastor, Jesus could only be in one place. And so he said, I need to multiply this thing because we've got a lot of work to do. So I'll empower you to go represent me. You see how it works? Isn't that amazing? God always works this way. He doesn't intend for us to work alone. He intends for us to do our own work. But he doesn't intend for us to work alone. So he's given them power and authority. And what did he give them power and authority over? All demons and all diseases. Is that a lot of power? That's a lot of power. 
And I want you to know that power is available to you here this morning. It's available to you watching online. And we're going to unpackage this a little bit. First of all, over is a relational term. Has anybody ever heard that uh, mankind was made a little lower than the angels? Yes, that's the way we were created. Well, Jesus has given you a position higher than all demons. Over is a relational term. So if God has given us power over all demons, that means even though we're created lower, we're now above. You follow me? And all diseases. We're going to talk just a little bit, I think, in a couple of questions about the healing process, so we'll leave that for right now. Notice the action. Follow the action. Jesus called. He sent out. And he told them to do what? Proclaim and perform. Proclaim and perform. This is the work that He's given us. Proclaim the kingdom of God and to perform healing. What are the elements of worship as designed as as we see here in these couple of texts? You see it on the screen there. Assembling together. It's part of worship. Now, we're going to follow along a little bit later. This doesn't necessarily mean the worship hour, and we've kind of bought into that Babylonian theology of a worship hour. We worship God wherever we are. We take church with us, and we're going to, I'm getting ahead of myself, though. Assembling together is part of worship with Jesus in the center. Can you say Amen. Recognizing God's power and authority. You know, a lot of times we get together, Mike, but it's not necessarily a worshipable event, is it? Because we fail at the simple thing of recognizing God's power and authority. You can do this in any place where there's, the Bible says, two or more of you together. Recognizing God's power and authority. And what's the last one? Sending out, evangel living, we like to call it. In other words, make sharing, proclaiming, and healing people your lifestyle. Not something that you have to prepare for and do so much like we often think. We're getting ready for evangelism. And then after five weeks of it, we go, glad that's done. Now we can get back to what? Regular scheduled programming, right? This is not the idea that the Bible presents to us. But what the Bible does recognize, and we'll get to it in a little bit in verse 10 and 11, is that we do need to come apart and rest a little bit, right? From time to time. We have periods of intensity and periods of rest. That's the way we're created, right? Daylight, period of intensity. Go to work, go to school. Nighttime, period of rest. Relaxation, rejuvenation. Right. So this is the way we're designed to operate. And I know some of you work at night and sleep in the day and, or try to. Right? Somebody's laughing. They recognize what I'm talking about. What is the verb here in verse 2? And it's on the screen there for you. It says in verse 2, And he apostoloi them to proclaim the kingdom. He sent them. That's the word right there. And so we get to this word apostle because we sometimes associate this with 12 And uh, we try and pass that lineage down and different things uh, in Christianity. But there's a big A, apostle. That was those 12. It's a proper noun when you talk about the apostle Peter. That's his name and his title, right? So it's a proper noun. There's a little noun, though, and that's all of us. Because God has sent each one of us as his representatives. That's all apostle really means. We talked about this last time I was here a little bit, I think. Um, Apostle is just one sent. It's a a messenger, an envoy, somebody who represents you, an ambassador. That's what the word means, little a. It can be anybody. It can be each one of us. It can be you 
watching online. And then we have apostle as a verb. And that's the word that's used here. It's the same root, but it's the action of sending a messenger. And so it's used in all three ways, both as a proper noun, as a lowercase noun, and as a verb. Christ's method alone. How many can say that with me? Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministering to their needs and won their confidence. Then he bade them, follow me. We want to look this morning about our mission, our method, and our message. What is our mission? Proclaim the kingdom. What is our method? Well, we use all kinds of methods, and some of them are more effective and some are less effective. But look, notice what uh, a good Bible commentator told us here. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. Isn't that just like God? Doesn't he desire your good? This is all about attitude. So when we're talking about our method, we have to approach it from the right attitude. Does it make sense? And then let's get into a little more of the mechanics of it. He showed his sympathy for them. He showed it. He didn't say he sympathized with them. You know the difference, right? He showed it. He ministered to their needs. He won their confidence. Are you seeing the order here? Because there's a lot of wisdom in this. And then he bade them, follow me. You see, a lot of times, I think, uh, if you remember back several months now, we talked about circles and distances and our influence, right? Anybody remember that? Am I talking archaic? (laughs) Anyway, we have a circle of influence. And uh, for those that are closer, we have way more influence over. You notice that Jesus had three apostles that he was really close to. And then he had 12 that he was a little less close to. If you turn over to Luke chapter 10, we're probably not going to get into it much today, but he sent out 70. And in other places it talks about he had 500 and so on. So, But for every little increment you go out further in the circle of influence, you have a little less influence over that relationship. A lot of times we approach people cold and we say something like, here's the gospel, sister, this is what you need. Anybody ever seen that happen? And she smiled because we have a relationship. She knew I was just joking. And yet I was serious at the same time. Right? But we have to have people's confidence. They have to know that we care. They have to feel that we care. It has to be demonstrated that we care, not just tell them. Right? We do a great job in this church generally, intellectually. We don't score so well relationally, spiritually, matters of the heart. We got the head down. I mean, we do strong there. Right, But when it comes to the heart, when it comes to uh, relating to our environment, we start to teeter a little bit. Those are things that we can improve on with God's help. But we need to have a relationship, the confidence of the person that we're trying to share before, notice, Christ's method alone, true success, uh, true there kind of gives an indication that there might be something that looks like success. We don't have any of that in the church today, do we? Have mercy. Well, we're going to move on. For what purpose? Why do we exist? Why did God create you? It's not a, it's not a rhetorical question. But it's good, it got your attention, didn't it? Why did God create you? 
to proclaim his kingdom. It, notice it wasn't even for your salvation. Because we have Christians uh, around the world that kind of feel that way too. Everything revolves around their salvation. That's not God's way. Salvation's important. I don't want to be misunderstood. But God created us to proclaim his praise. That's our purpose. That's our mission. Somebody has said uh, wisely that you are either a missionary or you're a mission field. Anybody ever heard that? I would modify it just a little bit because we're all sinners, right? Saved by grace. I would say that at different times in our experience, we're both missionaries or can be and mission fields. We all have need as well as a desire to do what's best for the Lord. Amen? What is the result? Notice the result of all of this sending, empowering, and so on. Isn't it wonderful? To dispel evil and to provide healing. Now this makes us sometimes a little bit uncomfortable because it taps into a power that we haven't necessarily realized all that we could have. And we start getting this, well, be careful. This is our spiritual, this is our heart part that we don't do so well at. We got the intellect down. You know, we can, we can nail the coffin shut when it comes to our theology. But when it comes to our heart, we get a little queasy. Can I hear an amen? amen. Notice what it says. The meaning of these verbs these, it says healing in verse 1, it says healing again in verse 2, but it's two different words in the original language. We're going to break this down just a little bit. The first one, we get the word therapy from it. Therapy. It has a dual definition uh, of healing, uh, to serve or to do service, to heal, cure, or restore to health. To heal, cure, or restore to health but to serve or to do service. So this is a, a word that shows us that everything doesn't always happen to happen, have to happen at one point in time. You know, we read through the Bible and, and, and we say, well, Jesus, you know, raised up somebody, stretched out a man's arm that was all withered and so on, and, and healed a woman that had been sick for 12 years, raised up a man that had been lying for 38 years, and just in a moment they stood up and everything vibrant again. And we get the idea that this is what the Bible means about healing. But it's not just that. It includes the process of healing. It includes the binding up of the wound. It, it includes the changing of the dressing. It includes anything that aids the body in its natural healing powers that God has given us. Amen. That was weak, but we'll take it. All right. Note, the word therapy carries with it the literal and figurative applications. Did you notice it? Literal, right now, like Jesus did, and figurative applications, including adoring God. There's a spiritual aspect in this thing. And can provide mental healing and assurance. So mental stability. Did you realize that just by reading the Bible, you can stabilize your mental state? Is that awesome? What a wonderful God we serve, and what a wonderful way he's designed this so that we can actually reduce our stress, Sharon, just by sitting down with God's word. A different word for healing is used in verse 2. Uh, it has a broader definition. It just simply means to cure, to heal, to make whole. Notice these, though. It gets kind of technical. Free from errors and sins told you it has a spiritual aspect. It's not just about our physical body. To bring about one's salvation after you've won their confidence. We need to be seeking those who don't realize, don't recognize, aren't sure that they have salvation. Maybe sometimes aren't even sure they want salvation. You know, we sit around church here and we kind of 
think everybody thinks like us, and it's all uh, warm and fuzzy. There's a whole world out there that's post-Christian in its thinking. I talked to one the other day over in Walmart and Wilson. You know what she told me? The first thing she told me, I'm Baptist. Okay, that means one thing to me. Then she proceeded to tell me that, well, you know, we don't need to go to church. I asked her if she was going to church for a resurrection, you know, ceremony. No, we don't need to go to church, you know. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, people that go to church are less good than people that stay home and worship by themselves. Post-Christian thinking, no matter what label you call yourself. And so there's a whole world out there that the devil has programmed another way. And we need to be careful how we show them that we care about them. I didn't tell her, Sister, you are wrong. And you need to pull that thing out your nose. Didn't go there, right? We have to show people that we care before we tell them how we believe we should behave. Isn't it true? This is a holistic approach to Christian service, seeking the well-being of those from here. In other words, away, outside of church. Notice the method of Jesus is not sit and wait and pray and hope for them to come to the temple, but to combine prayer and worship with going into the towns, into the villages, and homes to serve, bind up wounds, relieve suffering, mend the brokenhearted. Does this sound familiar? This sounds very much like the method Jesus had been demonstrating to his learners. Incidentally, that's the word for disciple, learners. We're all learners, right? There's one master, we're all servants. There's one teacher, we're all learners, right? You got that? Sounds very much like the method Jesus had been demonstrating to his learners for the last several months. Remember, we're around Jesus with the twelve this morning in our mind. Notice Jesus in his sermon to his hometown of Nazareth and Isaiah read these words. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. This is what our message is. And Jesus' method is the way that we have to reach people. Because if we don't have our mission and our method and our message in sync, the mission will fail. If we don't use the proper method, it's going to be less effective. If we don't use the right message, it doesn't matter what our methodology is. You follow what I'm saying? What's the point of verse 3? Take nothing for your journey, neither a staff, nor a bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not even have two tunics apiece. What's the point? Rely on God. Don't depend on yourself. You see, if I've provided for myself, how am I ever going to come to a message of giving God praise? I'll never get to what He's created me for if I've provided everything for myself. Notice, again, the methodology. Whatever house you enter, stay there. How many of you have a house this morning? Let's bring it back to 2016. How many of you have a house? Do you intend to stay there until you leave that city? All right. And when you leave here this morning, you're going to take church with you, right, to your house. You see, we get all wrapped around in our minds that church is... The worship hour. Where did we get that from? Anybody ever remember a program years ago called the Power Hour? Right? And we've adopted some of this thinking. But David says, I have the Lord always in my presence. In another psalm it says, where can I go to get away from you? If I go to the bottom of the sea, you're there. If I go to heights of heaven, you're there. If I go east or west, you're there. Where can I go? God is always with us. And so... Because 
church is just a gathering of God's people, then wherever there's two of us together praising God, their church is. Amen. If fewer words of human wisdom and more of the words of Christ were spoken, if there were fewer sermons, have mercy, and more social meetings, we would find a different atmosphere pervade our churches and our camp meetings. Seasons of prayer should be held for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because we can't have that over-relationship if we don't have an upper relationship. Does it make sense? Notice with me verse 12 as we continue on. Now the day was ending, and the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowd away, that they may go into the surrounding villages and countryside and find it lodging and get something to eat. For here we are in a desolate place. But he said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said, We have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless perhaps we go and buy food for all this people, for there were about 5,000. And he said to his disciples, Have them sit down to eat in groups of about 50. And they did so and had them sit down. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish, looking up to heaven, he blessed them and broke them and kept giving them to the disciples to set before people. And they all ate and were satisfied, and the broken pieces which they had left over were picked up twelve baskets full. Interesting. Notice that although the disciples had witnessed Jesus' power over and over again, when he said, you give them something to eat, their faith failed. They said, well, we just do a little bit, no money village wouldn't have enough even if we went to Clayton Kroger would be sold out we don't have Kroger here what is it, food line food line would be sold out that whole wall of bread there that whole aisle wouldn't be enough to feed all these people we're not like that today are we you give them something to eat We want to talk now about Sharon's illustration for the adults that the children got to listen in on. You give them something to eat. In order to give, we have to receive. That's the assembling together. When we're sent out, we're sent out to give, not to serve ourselves. As we give, we're empowered to receive more. As we receive more, we're empowered to give more. This gets into the parable of the talents, which is not our topic today. Jesus said, have them sit down in groups of about 50. It's interesting that in the Old Testament, there in Sinai, Moses, like the typical pastor today, was working himself into a grave. The people were getting worn out from standing in line waiting to see Moses. And Jethro came along and he said, Moses, you're going to not only wear yourself out, but you're wearing the people out. It was a no-brainer. The people realized it. Moses realized it. He said, here's a solution. I want you to appoint captains over tens. Captains over fifties, captains over hundreds, and captains over thousands. And then you oversee those leaders. Let them take care of all this business with the people. And so the way our ministry is organized is important. And Jesus example that right here. He had his twelve. 
to call together and people sit in groups. God never intended for one of us to do it all. We're a team. We minister together. And what a privilege it is to be on this team here at Little Creek Fellowship. Boy, that should have brought the house down, Dan. I'm disappointed. I practiced that all week, too. I want you to know. But notice this. We're talking about reaching people. Notice what it says. Verse 17. They all ate and were satisfied, and the broken pieces which they had left over were picked up twelve baskets full. Do you realize that a Bible commentator says that this very crowd, you can read it in the next couple of chapters, followed Jesus the next day. And Jesus had to tell them, you didn't come because you wanted living word. You didn't come because you wanted to worship God. You came because you got the day off and you were fed. Same people. You know what else it tells me? Judas had a basket full. We serve an incredibly gracious God. Don't miss that point this morning. Because when we go out and we see others, we get judgmental without even realizing it is going through our mind. Isn't it true? But Jesus here fed people that he knew were not going to receive him. Probably some of the same ones that plotted for his death and shouted crucify him. But he fed them. He gave them opportunity. And of course Judas, there ministering with the other twelve, picked up a basket full too. And in my selfish manly heart, I like to think that maybe his basket wasn't quite as full. But that's not what the text says. It says that Judas received the same blessing that the other eleven did. When the question comes home to your heart, whence shall we buy bread? that these may eat. Let not your answer be the response of unbelief. But what said Christ? Make the men sit down. And he fed them there. So when you are surrounded by souls in need, know that Christ is there. Commune with Him. Bring your barley loaves and fish to Jesus. If the work be of God, He Himself will provide the means for its accomplishment. As you have freely received, freely give. He will reward honest, simple reliance upon Him. If we go to the source of all strength with our hands of faith outstretched to receive, we shall be sustained in the work, even under the most forbidding circumstances, and shall be enabled to give to others the bread of life. Our problem today is not that we don't have opportunity. Our problem today is we don't use the right method. We don't look for the opportunity. And we don't capitalize on it when it's right in front of us. Have you received the bread of life? Will you impart it to others? Will you expect in your mind Asking and pleading for the Holy Spirit to fill you with a renewed vision of the message of the good news of the resurrected Savior. Will you employ His message whereby you draw close to people intentionally in order to seek their good and after you've fed them, seek to give them the ultimate good. Will you share the message that Christ has shared with you? 
that your sin is forgiven. So then, those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to breaking of bread, and to prayer. What are the four things they were doing? Continuing in sound doctrine, the word, fellowship, breaking of bread, fellowship, and prayer. This is church. It doesn't have to happen here in a particular hour. Wherever there's two or three gathered in my name, I am with you. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who were, had believed were get together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all, as anyone might have need, day by day. Did you get it? Not Saturday only? Not, not, not Sunday only? Day by day. The idea here is day after day. A continuum of worship. A continuum of studying the Word. A continuum of fellowship. A continuum of prayer. This is church. Continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house away from the temple. They were taking their meals together and with gladness and sincerity of heart. This word sincerity is interesting. It's a compound word. It's the only time in the Bible that it's used. And it has uh, one idea that is against whatever it is. That's the first word on the front. Uh, a negation of or a negative effect. The other one is uh, smoothness. And the example that's given is uh, of a, a stone in the pathway that you might stub your foot on, that that is removed. Do we have any smoothness between our hearts in the church today? Is our communion representative of the God that we serve? Somebody asked me earlier this week if I thought that the latter rain had begun. And whereas I think the latter rain is available, I would say based on these things, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. And what does that tell us? We need to plead that the Lord will open our hearts wider and fuller. We need to pray that we would receive more. We re need to plead that we would bicker less. We need to plead that we will let that thing go that happened back in 1952. Notice what the result is. Interestingly enough, I'll just mention here, you can jot it down, this uh, study is based on Luke 9, 10, and 11, and Desire of Ages 39 through 42. So if you want some extra reading this week, that's where you'll be able to enrich this study. Luke 10 and verse 20, what is the result? Here in Johnston County, if we employ God's method and God's message. Read it with, us, with me there on the screen. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. That's our result. That's our blessing. Oftentimes when we go out and do things for God, we look at ourselves, just like Peter did, walking on the water, and we look back and say, hey, guys. Oof. Rejoice that your name is is written in heaven. That's our only reward. 
And if that's our only reward, what else can we do but praise the Lord? I want to invite Justin up now as we have our closing.